there are, of course, a host, an army of people that the Lord has raised up throughout the history, throughout the annals of history, which uh, warrant our attention and which we could profit from uh, an understanding of their life and so on. But I decided to choose uh, this particular individual, Samuel Rutherford, uh, primarily for the, the selfish reason that uh, he's probably my favorite of, uh, of all of the various figures that God has given to us in the history, history of the world. We have the Augustans and the Calvins and several of the Puritans and you know, American Presbyterian ministers and, and others that we can look to and, and find benefit from. But this particular individual is one that has been of great help to me both in terms of the Christian life and in terms of um, our understanding of biblical doctrine and so on. I want to begin then this, this address on the life of Samuel Rutherford with a quotation. I'm going to begin just to give you a little taste of what the man was like. I'm going to quote first of all from one of his letters. Now, this is one letter, this are citations uh, from one letter that was written to, um, to Lady Kenmore. And um, he's writing in the year 1637. And he says in the middle of the letter, he says, I hope that ye are wrestling and struggling on in this dead age, wherein folks have lost tongue and legs and arms for Christ. I urge upon you, uh, I urge upon you, madam, a nearer communion with Christ and a growing communion. There are curtains to be drawn by in Christ that we never saw and new foldings of love in him. I despair that ever I shall win to the far end of that love. There are so many plies in it. Therefore dig deep and sweat and labor and take pains for him and set by as much time in the day for him as you can. He will be one with labor. Going on, he says, I am so in love with his love that if his love were not in heaven, I should be unwilling to go thither. Oh, what weighing and what telling is in Christ's love. I fear nothing now so much as the losing of Christ's cross and of the love showers that accompany it. Oh, that I should lay my black mouth to such a fair, fair, fair face as Christ's. He goes on, Oh, the many pound weights of his love under which I am sweetly pressed. Now, madam, I persuade you that the greatest part but play with Christianity. They put it by hand easily. I thought it had been an easy thing to be a Christian and that to seek God had been at the next door. But oh, the windings, the turnings, the ups and downs that he hath led me through. It goes on again in the same letter later down, I pray God that I may not give this world the credit of my joys and comforts and confidence that were to put, that were, uh, to put Christ out of his office. And he concludes the letter, Now woe is me for my whorish mother, the Kirk of Scotland. Oh, who will bewail her? This is a quote from one of the great giants of of Zion. And great men, speaking of great men, have unanimously agreed that this man ranks as one of the greatest and as one of the godliest. He was a remarkable man in a remarkable age. When When the skies were full of bright and shining stars, this particular Um, star that God had set uh, in the earth at that time shined especially uh, bright. I'm going to divide up his life into several sections and try to draw some lessons from it as we go and then especially as we come to the end. Uh, The first section I'm titling The Young Arrow. First of all, The Young Arrow. Rutherford was born around 1600 in Nisbet in the lowland uh, border countries of of Scotland. He would have been raised in the lowland culture and spent his whole life, as many of the great men in that age were, at least in Scotland, in the lowlands. Uh, We're given very little information about his his youth, but we're told a few things. He himself gives us an account of when he was probably five or six years old. So children, some of you are about that age. He was sitting with a few of his friends on the side of a well, and he fell in uh, this, this village well. And his friends ran to, to get help. Uh, it would have certainly uh, resulted in his, his uh, instant death, especially at that age. And when they returned with adults to, to see if he was still alive and to fetch him out of the well, there he was sitting uh, on the side of the well. And when they went up to ask Rutherford uh, what happened, he said, A bonny white man came and drew me out of the well. No doubt a reference as we have in Hebrews 1 uh, to the angels which the Lord gives charge to minister 
uh, his, his people, to his people. He graduated um, uh, in the, the, uh, the village or the local um, school that he was in, and then he went on to the Ed- Edinburgh University. He graduated there in 1621. Uh, in 1623, he became regent, professor of humanity, a, a Latin tutor, and um, was even at that time um, being formed with all of the, the scholarly abilities that the Lord would harness and uh, make useful uh, for his kingdom in the days uh, ahead and all of the, the labors that he would be involved in as a theologian. Uh, we're told that his conversion or references lead us to to um, conclude that his conversion was probably in his early 20s or mid-20s, maybe around 24, uh, after his resignation from being a professor. And so at about the age 24, later he looked, at, he looked back on uh, that time and said that he had wasted a quarter of a century uh, outside of Christ that could have been used uh, to apply uh, his strength to serving uh, the Lord. So something about the young arrow. Secondly, the godly pastor and, and powerful preacher. It was in 1627, uh, having been called to the ministry, that he settled in Anwath, the little village to, uh, for which he's come to be known and attached. The little village of Anwath. It's in Galloway, near Soloway, in the southwest of, uh, of Scotland. It would have been a scattered, uh, rural, uh, hilly district. We're told that he preached his first sermon on the text... Uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9 and verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, that those who do, who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Even from the early days of his ministry, God was fashioning him and shaping him and molding him through the fires of affliction. Uh, his wife uh, was, had a severe illness which laid her low for well over a year and ultimately culminated in her death, uh, which was to be followed shortly thereafter by the death of two of his his children. And if that wasn't enough, the loss of his wife, uh, the loss of two of his children, he too was struck with a a severe fever that laid him aside for 13 weeks. Uh, He laid in bed, kind of um, tinkering on the the edge of of death. We're told that... um, during this time, another minister writing about him said that he was always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always catechizing, always writing and studying, tireless, uh, spending and being spent for, for Christ's cause. His preaching um, was in some ways uh, unique. We're told that he had a bad voice but that, and that he wasn't you know, strikingly eloquent but that he was stirring and moving and affectionate and powerful because he was so full of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an English merchant who went to visit Scotland and writing about his visit. He said this, quote, I came to Irvin, Irvine and heard a well-favored, proper old man with a long beard. And that man showed me all my heart. It's a reference to David Dixon. Then I went to St. Andrews where I heard a sweet, majestic-looking man, and he showed me the majesty of God. It's a reference to Robert Blair. After him, I heard a little, fair man, and he showed me the loveliness of Christ. And that was a reference to Samuel Rutherford. We're told that especially during communion seasons, that, uh, that Anwath drew uh, large crowds which came to hear uh, this man preach about Christ crucified. The same minister writing earlier said of Rutherford, quote, Many times I thought he would have flown out of the pulpit when he came to speak of Jesus Christ. He was never in his right element, but when he was commending him. We're told that he fell asleep uh, talking uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer and that sometimes his dreams uh, were even full of Christ and of his love. And um, despite his, his valiant labors, um, despite all of his ar- ardent uh, labors among the people in Anwath, uh, we're told that, that there was little fruit in his ministry at that time. He himself describes it as, quote, a spiritual winter in Anwath. And uh, even the, the, the roof itself, the, the, the building was in disrepair, the roof was leaking. 
uh, the, the, the structure of the building uh, reflected what the people themselves were like. He had little to no fruit. He was nevertheless uh, loved by all ages. He himself took interest in all of the different people in uh, his parish. He, he took a special interest in the, in the young. There were the, the herding boys, the herd boys, who would help tend the sheep and so on in the, the hill country. And um, we're told that he would pray for them uh, by name. And even later on, when he's been removed from Anwath, he, he speaks about uh, these herd boys who he still has on his heart and mind and who he's still commending to the Lord uh, in prayer. He was a man who went on frequent walks. He would walk and pray. He'd go out early in the morning and walk. There was a Rutherford's walk where he would go up and down this one section praying, uh, do it at other times of the day. He was out on a Sabbath afternoon and came across some youth who were playing uh, football on the Sabbath, and uh, he rebuked them and admonished them for their Sabbath desecration and uh, pointed out their sin, uh, albeit, no doubt, with some sympathy and compassion. But um, as he spoke to the boys, he pointed and called upon three rocks that were around him as witnesses that would be brought to bear against them uh, on the last day. And... um, Thomas Chalmers, two centuries later, in going to to visit uh, Anwath and to visit the place where Rutherford was, went and saw this place, referred to to Rutherford's witnesses in a letter that he was writing. Here's a quote from Rutherford. Speaking of his time in Anwath, he says, There I wrestled with the angel and prevailed. Woods, trees, meadows, and hills are my witnesses that I drew on a fair match betwixt Christ and Anwath. Elsewhere he says, quote, My witness is in heaven, speaking to the people in Anwath. Your heaven would be two heavens to me, and your salvation two salvations. We see something of the pastor and the preacher. Thirdly, we see something of the reformer. Going on in 1630, uh, he was summoned before the court of high commission Uh, for his refusal to comply with the Perth Articles. Uh, These were articles which forced Episcopalian worship and uh, and, uh, government uh, upon the people. Things like requiring kneeling at the supper and private communions and private baptism and holy days and uh, the confirmation of uh, Episcopal bishops and so on. And he refused to comply. He was summoned again later by the Episcopalians to answer for his uh, writings against... um, Arminianism. He referred to the Perth Articles as dumb masks of anti-Christian ceremonies. In 1636, um, he had invoked so much uh, ire uh, by those who were then uh, in power that he was barred from preaching and he was exiled uh, to Aberdeen. He spent two years uh, in exile in Aberdeen and he at the time debated with the other theologians uh, who were there. He would debate with them on predestination and the atonement and free will and worship and justification and so on. He wasn't too impressed with Aberdeen. This is like the east uh, side of Scotland. He said, quote, it consists of papists and men of Gallio's naughty faith. It's a reference to Acts 18 verse 17 where it says, and Gallio cared for none of those things. He spoke about... um, the place being strongly opposed to Calvinism and predestination and so on, Presbyterianism. But the worst thing for him, there are two things that were especially uh, bad for him. One were what he called his dumb Sabbaths. So he was, he was silenced. Uh, his heart, his calling, uh, what God had uh, given him gifts to do, he was no longer able to do. He had to sit by. He wasn't able to preach. And this was a tremendous burden to him. Uh, The devil suggested to him that God had cast him off and that he was a spiritual favor, a failure rather. And nevertheless, it's that season, the exile in Aberdeen, that produced the bulk of the letters that have been compiled um, in in the Bonar edition, for example. So those 365 letters, the bulk of them were actually produced during this season of... um, of affliction and of disappointment. Uh, It was during that season especially that he enjoyed remarkable manifestations of the love of God in Christ so that he could write, quote, Christ and His cross are sweet company and a blessed couple, 
My prison is my palace. My sorrow is with child of joy. My losses are rich losses. My pain, easy pain. And he wrote all of these letters uh, to those who were, uh, he was keeping in contact with. Another quote, he says, quote, Happy are they who have passed their hard and wearisome time of apprenticeship and are now freemen and citizens in that joyful high city, the New Jerusalem. He spoke of being clay and longing for the world uh, to come. He says, quote, O my Lord, come over mountains at one stride. Oh, if he would fold the heavens together like an old cloak and shovel time and days out of the way and make ready in haste the lamb's wife uh, for her husband. And so you can see how the Lord was schooling him in the sweet things of communion with God in the midst of that difficulty. 1638, you had the Covenanter's Revolution. He was enabled to go back to Anwath and um, he fought, began, continued to fight there for the uh, Reformed distinctives, refuting William Laud and his Arminianism and attacking episcopacy, uh, applying his sword, especially then and for years to come, against one of his chief concerns, that was antinomianism. So we see something of the Reformer. Fourthly, we see something of the Presbyterian churchman. In 1638, he was made professor of divinity at St. Mary's College in St. Andrews. It had been a den of all sorts of uh, drivel and nonsense. And there's this tremendous change that took place when Rutherford came there. Uh, he accepted the, the, uh, the position as professor with one qualification, and that is that he'd be able to keep preaching regularly, which he did along with Robert Blair. So the two of them labored together. It's in 1642 that... Uh, and after 1642, that several books defending Presbyterian church government were written. He wrote, uh, first of all, The Divine Right of Church Government and Excommunication. It dealt with uh, polity and worship and New Testament forms. He wrote The Due Right of Presbyteries. He wrote A Peaceable and Temperate Plea for Paul's Presbytery in Scotland. And he wrote later an expose of Thomas Hooker, the New England Puritan's work on uh, church discipline. All of these are dense, heavy, thick, or most of them uh, theological treatises which deal in great detail with tremendous discernment of the various points of Presbyterian church government and worship and so on. Uh, his wife, of course, had died in 1640. Uh, he married uh, his godly second wife. They had seven children, all of whom died except for one. There was only one girl that, uh, that actually survived her father. Fifthly, we have the theologian. 1643 is a year uh, most of you will immediately recognize, a year that marked the calling of the Westminster Assembly, which met, the, 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 the majority of it met for four years. And there were five ministers and three elders that were sent as commissioners from Scotland. Uh, Rutherford was numbered uh, among these. Um, he preached while he was there in London. He wrote five major books while being a central figure in the labors of the Westminster Assembly. Those books included a, a tremendous book on covenant theology, which is still a classic, a book on providence, and a book uh, dealing with Calvinism. You have all of this literature, these theological writings, his, and some of his sermons that were published, like um, The Trial and Triumph of Faith. You see him taking the antinomians to task in his preaching, or the Covenant of Life, which I've mentioned, uh, and so on. He had a dominant role at the Westminster Assembly entering into the debates. He was on several of the significant committees. He, along with George Gillespie, his uh, junior uh, friend who was 30 years old, the youngest of the, uh, of the commissioners uh, at the assembly. Uh, he was, I told the story before, but I'll tell it again because it's so interesting. During the debates over Erastianism, that is the view that the state um, has authority over everything in the geographical boundaries which it, over which it rules, including the church, so the state is over the church. This was a very um, significant theological um, position held by several in the 17th century in England. Well, Gillespie uh, ended up being the figure God used to defeat that. Selden was called the Goliath of Erastianism, an older fella. And um, 
he's on the floor and he's debating and basically just has these overwhelmingly powerful arguments and a few fellows get up and try to take the axe and it's just bouncing off the tree. They're able to do very little. Finally, Rutherford wrote on a slip of paper uh, and, 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 and um, handed it to Gillespie in the hall and it said, De Lusum Domine. Or no, it said, um, uh, you know, get up. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. It said, uh, you know, you need to get up for Christ's cause, uh, for Zion's cause. You need to get up and defend the crown rights of King Jesus. So uh, Gillespie gets up and without a note, we're told, he went through every one of Selden's arguments and refuted them one by one. And then following that, went through and established irrefutably the biblical position, the Presbyterian position. And uh, he sat down. And Selden, this older and learned fellow, said, that young man has undone the work of eight years in one speech. And so Rutherford, you know, Gillespie had been sitting there taking notes, and Rutherford said, let me see your paper. And when he showed him his paper, it said, De Lusum Domine, De Lusum Domine, written down the page, um, O Lord, give light, O Lord, give light, O Lord, give light. He'd been writing it over and over again. So he's engaged as a theologian in the Westminster Assembly and in his writings. Um, it's interesting that he was in the committee that drafted the catechisms. There's a, in, in Edinburgh University archives, there's a, a copy, what appears to be a copy of the Shorter Catechism in Rutherford's handwriting. Um, he, we also have a, another fat book, Christ Dying and Drawing Sinners to Himself, which speaks about the law and the Christian, really, really rich uh, material that's to be found there as well. He speaks about the free offer of the gospel. Uh, Rutherford, understanding the free offer, was able to say, uh, quote, he's speaking about the warrant now, the warrant. He says, there is as much warrant for the reprobate to believe the gospel as the elect. In terms of warrant, the warrant of faith, there is as much warrant for the reprobate to believe the gospel as the elect. Sixthly, we have the political theorist. Um, if you mention the name Rutherford and if people know about Rutherford, they think of one of two, one of two things. Rutherford's letters, which are one of the choicest um, pieces of, of devotional literature bequeathed to us in the history of the world. And secondly is his book, Lex Rex. His book, Lex Rex, The Law and the Prince, Law, Law and the King, um, is also one that is well known. That was written in 1644. And um, it, was, uh, it was bold of Rutherford because basically he was, he was taking on all of the modern notions and he's saying we don't owe implicit obedience uh, to a king, to, to the ruler. He's saying um, that tyrants uh, are not uh, the friends of God, they're enemies of God, and they're to be opposed uh, by God's people. Uh, he was laying out uh, principles like um, there is a place uh, for the populace to uh, rebel against the ungodly, blaspheming uh, tyrants who, who are over us and so on. And uh, so he's expounding uh, the, a biblical, a thoroughly and exegetically based um, treatise on what the Christian political theory uh, should be. And uh, this book had tremendous influence uh, at the time. Uh, it's had tremendous influence subsequently. As many of you will know, there are those who say that Rutherford's Lex Rex had a, a, uh, a, a very significant impact on early colonial American thought you had and there's probably some truth to that because Witherspoon was an evangelical who had come from Scotland who taught at Princeton James Madison was under Witherspoon's tutelage and some of the other fathers and Lex Rex was used uh, in that uh, in the the, the the curriculum and so on uh, sadly it didn't have a significant enough influence on uh, the colonial thinkers at least in my estimation uh, in 1647, he went back to, to St. Mary's, uh, was made principal there. 1650, uh, he preached to the king, Charles II, on the duty of kings and uh, exhorted him boldly, fearlessly. Uh, in 1651, he was re made rector of the university and he had invitations from those in the Netherlands to go there and uh, uh, to labor uh, among them. He turned down those because he had a heart for Scotland. Um, during, we can't get into this, but during a division which took place in Scotland um, over um, Charles II primarily, there were two camps, the protesters and the resolutioners. He sided very, very, very vehemently with the protesters. 
and against the resolutioners, which included some of his friends like David Dixon and uh, Robert Blair, Blair um, he, he maintained that Charles II had made a hasty admission uh, to the Solemn League and, and Covenant. And um, he and people like James Guthrie contended for a more rigorous and faithful uh, attachment to the principles. James Guthrie, his friend, died on the gallows, a martyr's death for his Presbyterian principles. In 1661, um, you have the restoration of Charles II again. Um, the, the king had Rutherford's Lex Rex uh, brought out and publicly burned. Um, it was actually burned twice. It was burned in London, and it was burned in Scotland as well, uh, at St. Andrews, I think. So, they, they burned Lex Rex twice. It was not a popular treatise. There's a, there's a sense in which, you know, Rutherford, um, as a political theorist, was, was radical. And the reason he's radical is because he's seeking to be biblical and against the backdrop of, uh, of, a, of a, a domineering and unbiblical state, uh, speaking the truth uh, sounds r rather radical. And so he provoked a, a great deal of anger uh, by the magistrates. Uh, he was not, on, not only was Lex Rex burned, but he was deprived of, of all of his offices. And then in 1661, he was summoned before Parliament, but the citation uh, came uh, too late. They had burnt uh, his, his book again in 1661, first at Edinburgh, and then, here are the details, some days after um, at uh, his college in St. Andrews. So he's deposed of all his offices, and they summer, summon him to answer before Parliament of the charge of high treason. So he's, consi he's considered a traitor for his, his, his views. But he was already on his deathbed when the summons came. And on hearing it, uh, he calmly remarked that he had got another summons before a superior judge and judicatory and sent the message to Parliament, quote, I behoove to answer my first summons, and ere your day arrive, I will be where few kings and great folks come. We're told about his, his deathbed, that um, he would speak about heaven and speak about Christ in all these seraphic, uh, in seraphic terms. Uh, four of his brethren, ministerial brethren, came to see him a few days before he died, and he said, quote, my Lord and Master is chief of ten thousands of thousands. None is comparable to him in heaven or in earth. Dear brethren, do all for him. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. Beware of men pleasing. The chief shepherd will shortly uh, appear. Again, he spoke uh, uh, in several quotes I'd love to give you if we had time. But uh, on the last day of his life, in the afternoon, he said, last words were, quote, This night will close the door and fasten my anchor within the veil, and I shall go away in a sleep by five o'clock in the morning. And so it was. He rested in the Lord uh, that very night. Lastly, uh, number seven, uh, the man of God. And here we can draw some further lessons, I think, at least four lessons uh, from the life of, of Rutherford. First and foremost, this man is known for his piety. Here you have the marriage, the beautiful marriage of theology and of, of godliness together. These two things are brought together, an astute, deep uh, theologian and an earnest, eminently pious, humble, godly man. <clears throat> Herman Vitsius, the, the um, Dutch Puritan said in 1710, he said this, what, quote, what a blot it is on the Reformation that we reformed remain so deformed in our lives. And it's, it's against that, that we, that Rutherford stands out so brightly to us for his eminent godliness. If you read his letters, and I have commended it over and over and over and over and over uh, to various folks to get the, the unabridged edition of Rutherford's letters, you have a compendium of biblical devotion, of reformed godliness that uh, is, is second to none, at least in my estimation. You'll see shockingly uh, familiar and f affectionate language that will almost make you uneasy in terms of how he speaks 
of uh, his fellowship with, uh, with Christ. So there's few things I think we can draw. First of all, Rutherford is one who is so full of Christ. He says, quote, I would be further in upon Christ than at his joys, where love and mercy lodgeth beside his heart. He was absolutely, he lived Christocentrically. He was absorbed with the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, to understand Rutherford at all, you have to understand his attachment to Christ. His political theory, you know, his views in Lex Rex are really at root. The heart of it is an attachment to Christ. He's saying, we have Christ as King, Christ as Lord, Christ as lawgiver, and I will take great pains to preserve the place and the glory that belongs exclusively to Christ. And if magistrates will take to themselves what belongs to Christ, then we'll oppose magistrates. If other people take what belongs to Christ, then we'll oppose them. It's his attachment, his devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ that stands uh, behind that. We, we learn biblical godliness, the exposing of our hearts and of ourselves. Uh, he says, quote, There is as much need to watch over grace as to watch over sin. There's some maturity, you know, not just to be watching against temptation, but to realize that we're most vulnerable when, when we're strongest, when, we're, when, we're, um, when we have a lot of grace. We need to watch our heart, especially at that point. He says, quote, we live far from the well and complain but dryly of our dryness. He's saying, Christian, you know, here you are and there's a lethargy and there's an apathy and there's a deadness and there's a dryness to your soul. And you're living, you know, way, way away from the well. Duh. You know, those who are going to be filled and satiated with the things of Christ need to be living at the well. He says, quote, There cannot be a more humble soul than a believer. It is no pride. Um, it is no pride in a drowning man to catch hold of a rock. And holiness is his, his constant theme. You see it over and over. He would rise at 3 o'clock in the morning to pray. You read about the excruciatingly detailed self-examination, the way in which he ripped up his own heart uh, before, before the Lord. Thirdly, we learn something about how to suffer. We learn something about how to suffer as Christians in the life of Rutherford. He says, quote, The lentil stone and pillars of his new Jerusalem suffer more knocks of God's hammer and tools than the common, than the common sidewall stones. He says, My faith hath no bed to sleep on, but omnipotency. He's saying, My faith is resting in the, the all-powerfulness of, of God. He says, quote, Humility is a strange flower. It grows best in winter weather and under storms of affliction. Here is a man who, who knew affliction. His wife died, his second wife died, his children died, he suffered in the, the congregation, he's exiled, um, he's, he's derided and called trees, uh, a traitor, he's condemned to death, and all of these things intensified his attachment to Christ and sweetened the degrees of grace that, uh, that, were, that flourished in his soul. He had the fear of God. He had a passion for revival. He said, quote, there is universal deadness on all that fear God. Oh, where are the sometime quickening breathings and influences from heaven that have refreshed his hidden ones? He's looking for God to revive his church. He's looking for God to reform his church, to carry his church forward. When we visited Rutherford's grave, uh, he's buried in, in St. Andrews um, next to the ruins of the cathedral there, right at the sea. Beautiful, beautiful spot, the graveyard. And you can... You'll find his, his grave, Thomas um, Halliburton is, is buried next to him. And there's a long epitaph, I won't read the whole thing, but in the middle of that there's this phrase which I've kind of latched on to, in a sense maybe adopted. He, it says, among other things, one of the phrases is, For Zion's king and Zion's cause goes on most constantly he did contend until his time was at an end. For Zion's king and Zion's cause. That was the life of Samuel Rutherford. He spent his life for the Savior and for Zion, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave everything uh, in devotion uh, to, to Christ and His kingdom. 
Well, you may be asking yourself the question, and with this I close, you know, if Rutherford were here, what would Rutherford say about himself? What would he say of himself? Well, I'll tell you. He gives us a description of himself. And this is what he said, quote, A man often born down and hungry and waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a testimony that we all need. May the Lord help us to emulate by the help of the Holy Spirit and by His grace something of the gospel fruitfulness that's manifest in this remarkable life.